All right, so just want to welcome everybody in person and online. So glad you're here. And um, anyway, I want to get started today. And uh, I, I want to share something just real quick that's not related to this message. Just I've had several people or I've had uh, people interested or wondering about Israel and what's going on. I just want to read. There, there's one scripture on my heart I want to read and to... Um, that just related to this situation is Zechariah chapter 12, verse 1. And this has nothing to do with my message, but it was just on my heart. I wanted to share it just, just to help us understand some of the things that, that's going on here in Jerusalem. And Zechariah chapter 12, verse 1 is, is undoubtedly an end time prophecy. It's undoubtedly an end time prophecy about the end of the age, about the times we live in. And the word of the Lord, Zechariah was, was prophesying, and he says in verse 1, he says, the burden of the word of the Lord concerning Israel. And, you know, to try to figure out all that's going on and where this is going to lead, is this going to lead to World War III? Is this going to lead to the War of Gog and Magog? Is this going to lead to Joel chapter 2? Is this, what, where is this going to go? What's this going to do? A lot of, look, I don't think anyone but God knows where this is headed. But the, I, I, what, what I just was worshiping this morning, just this, this, this scripture verse was laid on my heart, is this really is the burden, what I'm about to say is the burden that's on God's heart. This is the burden that's on God's heart, what I'm about to share. And it needs to be the burden on our heart as well. And so he says, thus declare, this is, this is the word of the Lord for this hour we live in. Thus declares the Lord, who stretches out the heavens and lays the foundation of the earth and forms the spirit of man within him. Verse 2, the Lord says, Behold, I, not the devil, not the Palestinians, not the Iranians, not Turkey, not Saudi Arabia, not America, not Russia. The Lord says, I... Am going to make Jerusalem a cup that causes reeling, or actually, I think a better translation is drunkenness. You look around and you see the madness that's breaking out around the world. 50,000 protesting in London in favor of the Palestinians. The, the maddening things going on in New York, and you're like, what? I mean, even this is the thing that's most baffling to me. Even Christians on social media spouting out anti-Semitic rhetoric, and I'm going, what scriptures are you reading? And I can only say that what's going on is they've drunk in the cup that God has raised up and has made them drunk with anti-Semitism. And it comes from a lack of understanding. God has raised up Jerusalem. God has a controversy with the nations. And God has raised up, God himself has raised up Zion, Jerusalem, Israel to be a controversy among the nations to sift and to test the hearts of every single man and woman on earth. And we've got to know the scriptures. This is my burden. We've got to know the scriptures about what the Old Testament prophets have spoken about Israel. We've got to know the scriptures about God's covenants with Israel through Abraham, through David, the Abrahamic covenant, the Davidic covenant, even the new covenant was made with the house of Israel. And we've been grafted into it. Paul said clearly in Romans chapter 11, verse 28, is that even though he goes through Romans 9 through 11 and talks about how Israel has rejected the Messiah for the most part, God has judicially hardened most of Israel, but all of Israel will be saved when the fullness of the Gentiles comes in and then Paul says, even though, even though for the most part they are enemies for the sake of the gospel, because they've rejected the Messiah, they are chosen, they are elect for the sake of their fathers. For the gifts and the callings of God are, are irrevocable. That means the covenant God made with Abraham to, through Isaac, Jacob, ultimately through Jesus Christ, who is Jewish, by the way, I mean, if you have problems with a Jew who's going to rule the world, you're going to have real problems with Jesus, who is Jewish, who's coming back. A Jew is going to rule the world. 
I mean, if you have problems with that, you probably have problems with the scriptures because they're very, very, very clear. And so God has very clearly said that I have not rejected Israel. And even in their unbelief, God has not rejected Israel. And so my plea and my appeal to Christians who would, who would drink the anti-Semitic cup that's causing reeling and drunkenness to make sure you're not spouting off conspiracy theories you heard on YouTube. This is a very complicated issue. It's a very complicated question. I mean, I, books and books and books could be written about this, but um, it's so very important that we are on God's side in this. Okay? We're not even on Israel's side. We're not on the Palestinian side. We want to be on God's side based on the prophetic scriptures that God himself said, I am going to bring them back to the land in their unbelief. I'm not doing it for their sake. I'm not doing it because of anything they've done, good or bad. I'm doing it for my name's sake because he's faithful to his word. He's faithful to his promises. I, I, I just, it, it blows my mind how you can read the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation and look at what, has ha what happened in the modern state of Israel and not see that being one of the greatest miracles that's ever happened in history. It is it's phenomenal that the nations, I mean, do you think the nations right now would vote in favor of giving Israel their land? But they did. They, God moved in 1947 and the United Nations voted 33 to 13 to make Israel a sovereign nation. The nations of the earth made Israel a sovereign nation. And it was God's hand in that. And God, based on his promises, gathered them back from the north and the south, the east and the west, back to their homeland in fulfillment of the prophetic scriptures. And he's raised, God himself has raised up Jerusalem to be a, a cup of drunkenness. So be careful what you listen to, Christians, okay? Be careful on your YouTube shorts and all the different stuff you're hearing and conspiracy theories and all that stuff. Be careful what you're listening to. Because God, is, God has raised up Jerusalem. We want to be on God's side. So that said, I want to encourage you. Um, there, there's, a, there's like seven videos I'm going to reference here just real quick. There's a playlist called Understanding the End Times, and I have a session on there about replacement theology. And it's very important that the church does not buy into replacement theology. Because anti-Semitism has been here since the very, very beginning. And what is anti-Semitism is absolutely demonically inspired. Do not drink that cup or you will be going against God. It doesn't mean you have to agree with everything Israel does. It doesn't mean you have to, you know, you have to say okay, everything the Israeli government does. There's a lot of things the Israeli government does that's, that's evil and wicked. There's a lot of things the American government does that's evil and wicked. There's a, I should rephrase that and say there's few things America government does that's good these, these days. So just, you know, just it's understanding the end times, understanding the end times, a replacement theology, and then there's a whole playlist called 21 Days of Prayer for Israel. There's like six teachings. I, I think if you go back and you listen to that in, in light of this crisis, I think a lot of answers, you'll get a lot of answers to your questions. So anyway, just want to encourage you in that. So that has absolutely nothing to do with our message today, but just I, I just, just felt the need to share that. We're going to be praying for Israel um, when, this Wednesday night at 6 p.m., we're going to just be interceding because it is where this is going, no one knows. We, we've got to be in the place of prayer. All right, we're going to make a shift now to the teaching. This, to, uh, this is Renewing the Mind, Part 6. I mean, I have no idea. This is like the... Who, who, anyway, we'll just keep going and going and going in this, but Renewing the Mind, Part 6... We're going to talk, we're, we're breaking down uh, strongholds, of uh, different strongholds that affect people, that affect us. And so we're going through different strongholds in the mind, mental strongholds that can affect you and hinder the life of Jesus Christ from flowing out of you, from filling you, from the indwelling spirit possessing you. And so let's go ahead and turn our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, and we read this last week. We'll just, this is really our text for um, the next several weeks. I'm not sure. There, there, there's, I just kind of feel like right now the Lord is saying, bring the 
ax out to the root of every tree that he did not plant so the bride can be made ready. Mental strongholds, overcoming mental strongholds are vital to the bride being made ready. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, Paul said, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but they are divinely powerful. It's a two-edged sword of God's word is the weapon. They are divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Now, when Paul was writing... These fortresses that were very common in that day, they were like 15 feet thick walls that chariots could go on the top of. They were like 20, 25 feet high that kept the enemy out of four. They were fortified cities. And so Paul was using that as a metaphor to say, your thinking, Corinthians, your thinking is like a fortress, is like a stronghold that is keeping out God from moving in your life, that's keeping out uh, actually others from, you know, you from others as well. These are walls that you have built up over time. Mental thinking, mental processes, reasonings in the mind that exclude God, that, that keep God out and keep others out. And Paul's saying, it's time that we tear down these strongholds. These strongholds are complex. They're heart beliefs, their mental thinking, their mental thinking patterns. They are demonically, often demonically inspired. There are even things we suffered in our body, in our brain, through trauma and rejection and abuse. All these things combined can form to work mental strongholds. And Paul's saying, we are now coming with the sword of the spirit. We are destroying speculations. That word means reasonings. We are destroying reasonings and we are destroying every lofty thing that's raised up against the knowledge of God. And now here's what Paul says. Here's where Paul's getting at. And we are taking every thought captive. Every thought. Every single thought captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. What that means is, in other words, we're, every thought that we have, Paul's saying we want to take it and we want to make it a, a slave of obedience to Jesus Christ. We want to bring these thoughts and make, put them under the lordship of Jesus Christ. See, every thought we have, prideful, lustful, anger thoughts, thoughts of bitterness, thoughts of jealousy or envy or judgment, we want to take every one of those thoughts and bring them under the lordship of Jesus Christ for obedience unto him, full obedience to Jesus Christ. That's what Paul's getting at here. The reason we're doing this is because we want to see your obedience become complete. And that really is bridal readiness. That really is what bridal readiness looks like, is complete wholehearted obedience, that we would be wholeheartedly obedient to the Lord, that the righteousness he put into our spirit would be worked out into our mind, will, and emotions, and desires, and hearts, body, and actions, and all that we do, so that we would be righteous. And it comes by obedience, and obedience comes from thoughts. Okay, make sense? Last week, we talked about the stronghold of unworthiness, that, that so many people struggle from unworthiness. If you didn't hear last Sunday's message, I just want to encourage you to go back and listen to that message because there, unworthiness plagues so many people that you feel unworthy, unworthy of God's love, unworthy of his forgiveness. Whether that unworthiness comes from deep sin or abuse or rejection, what, whatever it comes from, that unworthiness locks you into this mentality that says, I'm unworthy of God's favor and blessing and love. I'm unworthy of anything. I'm just basically a hopeless hypocrite. And God wants to set you free from unworthiness. Okay. This week, we're talking about a, the stronghold of rejection. And this one is going to be one that every single person in this room has battled, okay? So as we talk about the stronghold of rejection, please don't feel like I'm the only one here that has experienced this. Trust me, as a pastor, I know things that other people may not know. Um, every one of us have suffered with some form of rejection, some, some deeper, some not as deep, but still all of us, it is a, this is probably the number one thing 
that, that a lot of us would battle without even realizing we are the way we are because of rejection, because we have been rejected in some way, some form, somehow. We have been rejected, and therefore we develop, we are planted in the soil of rejection rather than the soil of God's love, and therefore the fruit that is now coming out of us is coming out because the root we're planted in is the soil of rejection and not the soil of God's love. And so if we're producing bad fruit in our life, it's probably coming from the soil we're planted in. And so God wants to deliver us from the stronghold of rejection. We're going to talk about the stronghold of rejection at least for two weeks, this Sunday and next Sunday, maybe even more, because this really, really affects every single one of us. I believe with all my heart the, the stronghold of rejection is, is the, one of the number one strongholds people must break through for them to be made ready as a bride for Jesus Christ. Because when you are rejected and you feel rejected, it's impossible to give love. And so we need healing from rejection. Okay. When God designed us, God designed us for the first and the second commandment. God designed us and created us to be people who received his love and then people who loved God and loved others. God designed us as lovers. God designed us for that, that innate need to experience the love of God in relationship with him and to give God that love back and to give others the overflow of the love we have for God. That's the way we have been designed. And so that's why John in John 4, uh, 4 uh, 19 says, we love because he first loved us. The love that we have comes up, is a result of the, um, the love God has shown us. And so to the degree that we love God and to the degree that we love others is the degree to which we have experienced the love of God. Therefore, if we have a very shallow experience of the love of God, we're not going to love God very much and we're not going to love others very much. But if we have experienced God's love for us, we talked about that last Sunday, the same way the Father loves Jesus he loves you. In the same way Jesus is loved by the Father, Jesus loves you. I mean, it's unfathomable how much God's love is directed towards you. And the degree that we know that by revelation is the degree to which we will love God and love others. But if we don't know that, we are going to be pl we're planted in the soil of rejection. And I, I believe that one of Satan's ultimate strategies in spiritual warfare against you, by the way, did you know the devil has a plan to destroy your life? One of the number one ways that God, or one of the number one ways that the devil wants to destroy your life is by putting into your life the seeds of rejection. And those seeds of rejection begin to fester and grow. And when those seeds of rejection mature, what happens is we begin to produce the fruit of rejection. I'm going to talk about that in, in a minute. But So there is, a, there is a demonic strategy from hell against you to, to, to plant seeds of rejection in you that grow and grow and grow until they're a fully mature tree producing the rotten fruit of rejection. And so one of the ways to be free, one of the ways to be set free from rejection is first of all to even know that that's happened. To even know that that is a strategy against me. I, like, I, I remember when God was dealing with me on this, I had no idea. And once I saw, oh wait, that has been the, that's what the enemy's been trying to do. He's been trying to put a root of rejection into me. My eyes were open and I realized, oh my goodness, the way I am, the way that I, the person I become is because of rejection. I had no idea that I was producing this negative fruit of rejection. I had no idea. And when the light shined into it, it made so much sense that I am the way I am because of rejection. And so because we have this, this innate need by God to be loved and to love is that whenever, whenever anyone refuses us or it doesn't acknowledge us, doesn't approve us, or doesn't consider us, we experience rejection. And there's, there's all kinds of negative emotions. I'm sure we, all of us, I don't have to describe it, but all of us know what those negative emotions are. And, and so when, when that happens is that seed begins to mature, that seed begins to grow, and every single tree has roots, and every single root produces fruit. 
So if, you're, if there's rotten fruit in your life, there's, there's fruit in your life that you don't like, judgment, rebellion, anger, lust, bitterness, whatever, then you got to see, okay, there, it's coming from a root, and therefore what root is it, is, it, is it coming from? What soil is it coming from? Because if you want to change the fruit, you got to change the root. If you want to change the fruit, you got to change the soil. See, you're not going to be, you're not going to experience transformation if you stay planted in the soil of rejection and not planted in the soil of God's love. See, Paul said in uh, Ephesians chapter 3, let me just read this scripture here. Ephesians chapter 3, just, this is a, I, I just want to encourage you to meditate and memorize the scripture. This is so, so important. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17. Just want to encourage you to, to read it, pray it, meditate on it. Ask God to do this. That Paul said that, that you, Ephesians 3, 17 through 19, that you being rooted and grounded in love. He's not talking about hu your human love. He's not talking about you being rooted and grounded in human love. He's talking about the love of God that surpasses knowledge. So Paul is saying here, you can see the tree metaphor that Paul has here. You're a tree. You as a tree need to be rooted and you need to be grounded in God's love for you. I remember in, in 2008, Angie and I went to uh, San Francisco to Muir Woods. And I don't know if you've ever seen the redwood trees, those redwood trees. I mean, they're massive, massive redwood trees. And they have these, these massive root systems. They don't go... Uh, really deep, but they're these they're 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 very shallow, but they intertwine with all these other root systems. So when you go, you can see these massive root systems interconnected with other trees. And it just reminded me of that's the way that's the way we must be in the experience of God's love. We must be rooted and grounded like that tree in the experience of God's love. Because what, whatever we're rooted in, whatever we're grounded in, is going to be the fruit that we produce. If we're rooted and grounded in God's love for us, then we're going to produce the fruit of the Spirit. And if we're rooted and grounded in rejection because of what's happened to us throughout our life, if we stay in that root, if we stay in that soil, we stay grounded in that soil, we are going to produce the fruit of rejection. And so Paul continues on, that you being rooted and grounded in love. I, I'm not sure if there's anything more important as a Christian for us to be rooted and grounded in God's love. It's the, it's the, it's the foundation of everything. It, it is everything that if we don't know the love of God for us, if we don't know the way God feels about us, then we are going to be a tree in the wrong soil, producing the wrong fruit. And that's why Paul said, he goes on and says, that you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. He's not talking about here a Bible verse you know, he's not talking about Jesus loves me, this I know for the Bible tells me so, being able to sing that song. He's not, even, he's not talking about you being able to stand up and preach a message on the love of God. Paul here is talking about experience. He's talking about the experience of God's love, that, that you must experience God's love. And it's not just a one-time experience. It's meant to be experienced over and over and over and over and over and over to the point where your root system goes down so deep inside of you into God's love for you that you naturally produce the fruit of love, which is the fruit of the Spirit. And so I would make it one of your number one prayers in your time with God, Lord, I want to know the love of God that, that, that surpasses knowledge. I want, to, I want to experience the love of God that you have for me. You can even pray Song of Solomon where the bride says, let him kiss me with the kisses of your mouth. And that's not like, you know, a Jewish man with a beard kissing you on the lips, okay? That's applied allegorically or spiritually. That is the love of God 
giving you, by his spirit, a revelation of his personal affection for you. We got to know God's personal affection for you. You've got to know God's personal affection for you. You've got, if you don't know God's personal affection for you, okay, not just a theology, we need the theology, not just a teaching, not just 1 John 4 19, we love because he first loved us, not because God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son. Paul's saying all that's, that's all good. Paul's saying, but you've got to go beyond the knowledge of it to the experience of it to where you feel it and you experience it and your emotions are washed in it and you're cleansed by it and it's wave after wave after wave after wave of God's love crashing over your soul until you are ruined for life by the love of God. I tell you that if you ever experience the true love of God that comes from him, you will be ruined forever. You will be ruined forever. It will ruin your life forever. His love his love is better than life. His love is better than wine. His love is better than any pleasure of this earth. The love of God overflowing to you till you experience it and you're overwhelmed by his love directed personally to you. Not a theology, not a teaching, not a Bible verse, not a song. The experience of it where you experience it Personally, it is, it is the most vital need you have. It's the most vital need that I have is to know the love of God that surpasses knowledge that, I would, that we would be filled up with all the fullness of God. See, have you ever thought about this when Paul talked about the fruit of the Spirit and he said the fruit of the Spirit is love? Love is the foundational. Is, love is the foundation of all the other fruits. In fact, if you even compare Galatians 5 and 1 Corinthians 13 where Paul talks about love, what you'll see is that when Paul says love is kindness, love is not being rude, those are actually the fruits of the Spirit. So when you are planted in the soil of God's love, you begin to manifest the fruit of the Spirit. You begin to produce the fruit of the Spirit naturally, just like a natural apple tree planted in the soil produces apples. When you are planted in the love of God, rooted and grounded and planted in the love of God, then you will produce the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. In fact, you could just do the study on that. I did it one time. Uh, of comparing 1 Corinthians 13 and Galatians chapter 5, and you, what you see is that love is the fruit of the Spirit in action. Love, the fruit of the Spirit is, is love manifested. The fruit of the Spirit is joy. See, love is joy. That's what Paul says. Love rejoices in the truth. The fruit of the Spirit is faith. Paul says that love believes all things. The fruit of the Spirit is kindness. And Paul said, love is kind. The fruit of the Spirit is patience. Paul said love is patient in 1 Corinthians 13. It's pretty phenomenal that if we're really going to produce the fruit of the Spirit, then our root system must be transplanted from the soil of rejection that we have experienced in the past and be transplanted into the soil of God's love. Amen. When you are, here, I'm going to list some of the fruit of rejection now, and I'm going to, next Sunday, I'm going to go into a lot of more of, this is the reason why this fruit is produced, and this is how it's produced, or this is how and the what, the what and the how of how this fruit is produced when you experience rejection. But here's some of the fruit of rejection. Rebellion. See, if you've been rejected, a lot of times, one, because of the pain you experience in your rejection, a lot of times... You respond by rebelling, rebelling against authority, rebelling against institutions, rebelling against organizations, rebelling against society because you have experienced pain. So rebellion, I'm going to go into that in more detail in the next, se next session. Rebellion, when, so re if you find yourself, okay, I, I have this rebellious tendency, prob not to say all the time, some rebellion is rooted in pride, but a lot of rebellion is rooted in rejection. You've been rejected, and it causes rebellion, the fruit of rebellion. Independence. See, when you've been rejected and you've experienced some type of rejection, you, real, you begin to think, well, who can I trust? I can't trust 
this person. They've rejected me. I can't trust authority that they let me down. I can't trust, you know, this person or that person, this relationship or that relationship. I've got to do it myself because I just simply can't trust anyone. Why? Because I've experienced rejection when I relied on these people, so I'm just going to do it myself. And it forms an independence in you and me. Anger. A lot of the reasons why people struggle with anger, if, if you have an anger issue, if you have an anger issue and you can't get victory over anger, you may not even realize this, but a lot of times your anger is rooted in rejection. It's re rooted in the pain you experience in rejection and it's manifested in anger because you are responding to the pain you experience in rejection and therefore, in that response, your response is anger. You, you, you demonstrate it through anger and, um, and exploding and, you know, just going off the, just like a bomb, just explosions of anger. Bitterness. You know, uh, Hebrews 12 warns us, make sure there's not a root of bitterness in you. Because if there's a root of bitterness in you, it will spring up and will defile many people. When you have bitterness in your heart, that bitterness is going to defile many people. You may not realize it. You may not even know the effects of it, but that bitterness in you is going to defile many people. Well, that bitterness so often comes by experiencing rejection. You experienced rejection some way, some form, however it was you were rejected. You experienced that bitterness, and when you experience that bitterness or you experience that rejection, over time you began to get more and more and more bitter. Bitter about what happened. Bitter about this person who rejected you. Bitter about what the circumstances you experienced. Bitter about what happened to you by this person. And it creates this bitterness. And you begin to actually become a root. You begin to be rooted in, the, in, the, in bitterness, which defiles many. Insecurity. A lot of our insecurities about ourselves about our situation, our own, the things we don't like about ourselves, the things we want to change about ourselves, the things we, uh, we even reject ourselves for. A lot of that insecurity comes from the fact that we have been rejected. And that insecurity manifests in also inferiority, where we have insecurity and inferiority and we have low self-esteem, is because we are not rooted and grounded in God's love for us. We're not rooted and grounded in the way God feels about us. And because of that, we don't know the love of God. We are insecure. We, are, we feel inferior. We try, to, we try to then cover that with the way we look or how smart we are or our achievements or our accomplishments or how much money we make. But at the end of the day, what it comes down to is you're basically insecure. I heard of a study that someone, I, I just, this is just right off the top of my head, so I, I don't know, the, I may not say it exactly right, but someone did a study of high achievers, and they found that most high achievers had experienced serious rejection in their life. And so they, they covered the pain they experienced by performance. They covered the pain they experienced by doing better. Even, even perfectionism. We're going we're gonna to do this as good as it can be. And so what it really was is inside, internally, they're trying to cover the pain that they had experienced to say, if I do it better, if I do it to receive praise, I won't have to experience the rejection I felt when it hurt me so bad. So in an insecurity, inferiority, low self-esteem, you know, just, just so focused on, you know, I struggle with the way I look or I, I struggle with, you know, I'm not smart enough or, you know, just whatever it would be. I struggle with weight or, you know, a million different things, education, whatever. Insecurity and inferiority is really a, a fruit of rejection. Some of you are going, well, that's uh, check one, check two, check, 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 check. Probably all of us, if we're honest, all of this have been, I, I was affected by a lot of these things and I'll, I'll share that in a minute. But I just want you to realize, okay, I just want you to know, I assure you, you're not the only one going, okay, that's, that's me, that's me, that's me. We're probably all of us struggle with this in some degree or another. Escapism, where you, you feel like, okay, you know, you can do escapism through video games or through working harder or through drugs and alcohol. A lot of reasons people turn to drugs and alcohol is because they have experienced rejection and they're trying to escape the pain of rejection that they have experienced 
and they turn to drugs and alcohol as a coping mechanism to, and really what, what's really hurting inside of them is that pain of rejection they've experienced. And so they're, they're trying to get healing by drugs and alcohol and it's actually making their situation far, far worse. To, and they escape through that. Distrust, where you don't trust anyone and you, you're suspicious and you're thinking, well, I doubt very seriously this person's going to come through, but we'll see. Or you feel like, you know, I trusted this person once. I trusted them twice. I trusted them so much, but they let me down, and therefore I just can't trust anyone again. I just got to do it myself. You know, it's just going to be me and God because I can't depend on anyone else because when I did, they let me down. Distrust. Jealousy is huge. If you've experienced rejection, jealousy is huge. Where you feel, re- because you're rooted in rejection, you get jealous because this person is blessed. You get jealous because this person seems to have it all together. You get jealous when you look at social media, which, again, if you look at social media, just realize it's just a phantom, okay? It's not real. Social media is not real. It's like, taking your very best pictures and putting them out there, and no one's life is that good, okay? No one's life is that good. I I can hardly get on much social media anymore because just like, yeah, (laughs) okay, you're awesome. We get it. So don't, you know, don't get jealous over people over social media because just don't do it. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of time. They po- you know, you, I do it too. We all post our very best pictures and we're all smiling and happy. And, you know, it's like, yeah, but really your life is a total mess. You got like 10 seconds of a, a smile on your face and the rest of your face is miserable. Don't get jealous over people on social media because I assure you their life is not nearly as good as they're portraying on social media. So, but when you're rooted in rejection, is you easily get jealous. You get jealous because you feel as if someone else having, having this blessing or that blessing is actually, and you don't have it, actually means you're not valuable and you're not worthy. And you can get jealous because they're experiencing blessing and you're not. And, and it really is rooted in this low, inf- this low self-esteem inferiority because you're jealous because you feel like you don't have what this person has. And it really is rooted in the fact It comes down to the love of God. Now, I'm not saying jealousy is always rooted in that, but a lot of times it is. Judgmentalism. A big part of judgmentalism. If you have a critical spirit, okay, if you have a critical spirit, if you you struggle with criticism, criticizing others, a lot of times what you're doing is you're criticizing others because if you criticize others, you're rejecting them before they can reject you. (laughs) Yeah. See, it's a defense mechanism of rejection because you say, okay, they're not going to reject me, so I'm going to reject them before they can reject me. And how do I reject them? Well, I find faults in them, and I speak about that, those, those faults. You know, they do this this way, and I can't believe they do this all the time because they're always doing it this way and that way, blah, 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 blah. And we start gossiping and criticizing and being judgmental. Now, some of the, some judgmentalism is rooted in pride or religion, but a lot of it is rooted in rejection because we want to be, we're critical because we think if we reject them, then we feel better about us because at the end of the day, we don't really feel good about us because we're rooted in rejection and not in God's love. I see a lot of your eyes are getting really big. You're like, whoa, I didn't, I did not, I did not know this about me when God, I'll share my testimony in a few minutes, but when God started dealing with me with the root of rejection, I had no idea why I was, I was so critical. And, I, you know, I, I really, when I realized it, I was like, oh, my goodness. That's exactly what I'm doing. I am rejecting somebody. I am being critical about somebody before they can reject me. I'm saying things about them or they do certain things or whatever. I'm judging them so I don't have to feel rejection. Fear. Or you could say timidity. If you, if you have timidity, if you have the struggle with timidity, low self-esteem, timidity, where you have a fear of man, it's, it, is, it is because you're not rooted in the love of God. Paul, uh, John said in verse John 4, 
there is no fear in love. Well, why did he say that? Because love drives out fear. Love casts out fear. There's no fear in love. When you are experiencing the love of God, the true authentic love of God communicated by the, by the Holy Spirit, that, that, the, the love of God communicated by the Holy Spirit drives out fear, drives out the fear of man, drives out timidity, drives out this inferiority around people. I just feel so insecure. I feel so, you know, like, you know, just I'm going to be rejected if I say the wrong thing or whatever. It's the love of God. The, again, it's the love of God that is the, is the remedy. There is no other remedy but the love of God. It, it, I'm just... I can't give you any psychological answer, but the love of God. That is the, that is the cure to the root of rejection. But fear, insecurity, in, inferiority. Um, if you struggle with the spirit of fear, it could very much be rooted in rejection. That you've experienced that rejection, and therefore you fear rejection. You fear man because you realize of what, you know, the pain of what you went through. Uh, hopelessness. You know, if you've, if, you, if you've experienced that rejection, you, just, you can even get to this place of hopelessness. There's no hope. Um, it can bring you to this place of, of depression, hopelessness. If you, if, you struggle, if you struggle with depression, okay, now, d- d- depression is complicated, okay? Depression is a complicated thing. I would say if you, if you struggle with depression, start exercising, eating better, because <laughs> may that depression may go right away. Stop sitting around and watching TV because... That depression might go away because a lot of it just, you know, get exercise, eat healthy. That helps a lot. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to try to be an expert on clinical depression. But some depression is rooted in rejection because you've been rejected and therefore you've been rejected. You, you feel sad because of the pain of that rejection. Okay, so... If, if you struggle with depression, it might be because there's a root of rejection you're dealing with. Defensiveness. That's a big one. If you're talking to somebody and every time you say something, they're getting defensive, you're like, whoa, man, okay, I just said your football team wasn't very good. I mean, why are you so defensive? You know, I don't know whatever the, whatever the analogy would be. You know, I, I, I just said you didn't like that shirt. You know, that shirt, there's a better shirt than you are. Whoa, you know, why are you getting so defensive here? Why are you getting so defensive? You know, if you've ever been that way in relationships and you're like, man, I can't even say anything. They just get so defensive. I'm just trying to, like, share something that I think will help you do something better. But there's just like, boom, defense walls go up. What's happening is nine times out of ten, it's a coping mechanism from rejection where these walls of defensiveness goes up. And like, I wasn't even saying what, half the things you thought I was saying. I was basically saying that blue shirt looks better than that purple shirt or whatever. I saw a man, I mean, I was, like, you don't think I'm pretty. You think I'm ugly. No, I mean, you know, whatever. I'm just trying to throw stuff off the top of my head. So <laughs> whatever it is, like, no, I just like blue better than purple. That's it. I, there's no hidden thing here, you know. <sighs> so that, that defensiveness, that, you know, that defensiveness and rooted in rejection where you, you're, you're you're, def- you're defending yourself because you're trying to be that wall of protection against you being hurt by somebody else's comments or, or criticisms. Once you realize that, you're like, oh, wow, I was doing that. <laughs> hardness. You know, people that have been rejected can easily grow hard. And God's love makes you tender. God's love makes you tender and soft. Rejection hardens you. And so if you have grown hard and cynical, it's probably rooted in rejection. Competition is rooted in rejection. Now, I I guess we should, hopefully Georgia gets really rejected because we want them to compete better. But, I mean, if if you are like ultra competitive, now that doesn't, I I don't want to make this clear not everyone who is competitive has been rooted in rejection, okay? So, but sometimes if you've been rejected, one of the ways you cope with that is you're ultra competitive because you're saying, I've got to beat them at no cost. Because if I don't win, I feel bad about myself. Perfectionism. We have to do, we have to do, there's a, there's a real balance between perfectionism and excellence. Perfectionism is, we got to do every single thing perfect because if I don't, 
do every single thing perfect, I'm going to be rejected for my work. I'm going to be rejected for the way I look. I'm going to be rejected for a million different things. So we've got to do every single thing perfect so we don't experience rejection. Withdrawal and isolation is when you have experienced rejection, you begin to withdraw. You don't want to be around people. You want to be isolated where you can feel safe and you don't feel like you're going to experience rejection from people. And then the last one we'll, just for today is, is control. Is if you struggle with control, nine times out of ten, there's a root of rejection because you've got to control everything because if it gets outside of your control, then something might happen where you experience rejection and you can't make, you can't allow that to happen. So you control the situation. You control the circumstances so that you can ensure you aren't rejected. Okay, so I basically just describe everyone in this room. <laughs> and everyone watching online as well. Okay, again, Everyone is affected by rejection. Okay, just be a pastor if you don't think that's true, okay? Everyone is affected by rejection. Everyone's affected by rejection. And the, the sooner we realize this, so much of this is, real, is realization, is realizing the demonic strategy that's arrayed against you. That there is a strategy from hell to destroy you, and one of the number one strategies, if not the number one strategy, is to develop in you a root of rejection that produces all of this fruit that I just described, because just a small seed, a small little seed of rejection can create this wound the devil can build a stronghold in. And again, everyone has been, been very much affected by, by rejection. And so what I want to encourage you all about as we focus on overcoming the stronghold of rejection is you can either live in this pain that you are experiencing or you can, ex you can face how you've been rejected even though it's temporarily painful so you can experience healing and then you can walk in freedom going forward. So you're either going to limp around in the pain you're experiencing or you're going to face it and go, okay, this is really painful because it is painful. It is painful to face, I was rejected in these situations. I was rejected in these circumstances, and therefore I've, I've been rejected, and therefore I'm just not, I'm just not, I don't want to face this. I don't want to face, deal with my issues. I'm just going to limp around. It reminds me a little bit, my mother-in-law just had hip surgery, and before her, or hip replacement surgery, before her surgery, she was in just in tremendous pain of, of walking. I mean, she could barely walk. It was really, really painful. So she had hip replacement surgery. And she has had basically the week from hell after her surgery. She actually broke her femur after the surgery. She had had two surgeries. And, I mean, she was the, the, the hip and the femur were detached. So she was experiencing this. I mean, even moving was just an agonizing pain. But that's, you know... She decided, I mean, I'm not sure if she would say, well, if I knew that was going to happen, I would do it again. I don't know. I haven't talked to her about that. But she realized, okay, I can either limp around the rest of my life or I can take about a week or a week and a half or a month or three months, I don't even know how long it takes, six months to recover from hip replacement surgery. And then I can, I can, you know, I can then have a good pain-free walk for the rest of my life. And she said, I'm going to face a temporary pain. And then after that, I'm going to walk normally. And that's kind of the way it is with rejection is I just want to encourage you, don't, you know, as painful as it is, as painful as it is, face, face it. Look at it and say, yeah, you know, I experienced rejection here, but God loves me. God loves me. And, and so because that's the, that's the key to freedom. That's the key to going free is, 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 is saying, okay. I'm going to face it, and I'm going to overcome it. So I, just, just real quick, I, I mentioned just earlier, but about 25 years ago, and over 25 years ago, before I got married, just really pressing into the Lord, and just, I, I can rem remember this very clearly, praying, and the Lord was like telling me, Brian, you have a root of rejection. I was like, what? A root of rejection? What does that even, what even does that mean? And... Um, 
I began to, to just, just really seek the Lord. Okay, God, I feel like I've got a root of rejection. What is, what is a root of rejection? What does that even mean? I don't even know what it means. I have no idea. I had no idea back then that was the reason why I was the way I was, you know, for many years. The person I had become was shaped by rejection. I had no idea about that. And then I read uh, Joyce Meyer's book, The Root of Rejection. I, I highly recommend that book if you, if you struggle with rejection. I highly recommend The Root of Rejection by Joyce Meyer. I really believe Joyce Meyer has an anointing from the Holy Spirit to help set people free from the root of rejection. And so when I started reading that, I was like, oh, my goodness. Every single thing I do is because of rejection. I'm like, oh, my gosh, rebellion. I went into rebellion in high school. Well, it was it was rooted in rejection, and it's kind of a weird thing. I, I, you know, just thinking about this, you know, as you, you know, as you pastor and do counseling and you talk to people, you realize, okay, man, there's a lot of people that have experienced really, really deep rejection. And I'm like, okay, my parents were awesome and are awesome, and they, they love God, loved God back then. They raised me almost perfect. Like, how could I have a root of rejection from them? And it wasn't from them. So, like, how could I have a root of rejection? What the Lord began to show me was a root of self-rejection, where the devil was moving in my life to, see, if the devil can get a stronghold of rejection in your life, he can, he can distort the fruit of the Spirit and, and distort and, you know, mess up your testimony. So that, that strategy of rejection begins when you don't even have a clue. It's when you're, you know, when you're, even when you're born, there's a strategy at the very birth to, to put rejection into you that you aren't even aware of. You're not even aware of it. And so I wasn't aware of it, but the Lord began to show me that, that I had self-rejection. I, re I rejected myself. And so I had to cover that rejection by, by my appearance. And so, I, you know, back looking back then, you're like, why did you choose bleach blonde hair with long hair? That made you look worse. I don't know why I did that. I don't you know, I got into like bodybuilding and working out and tanning bed all the time and all this stuff. But I was so concerned about the way my appearance looked. And I remember, I remember even in high school, we, me and my, fr my, my friend had like this, this like Avengers body, you know, like chiseled abs, everything. And I was trying to compete with him and I didn't have that. And I tried to compete with him and I went on this, like he went on this like really high protein, low fat diet. And I did the same thing to try to compete with him. And I ended up looking like, Tom, I don't know if you knew who Tom Petty is. I looked like Tom Petty. Uh, seriously, because I had long, long blonde hair. Someone actually told me that. He's like, you look like Tom Petty. And I was like, that's not what I wanted to hear, you know. I mean, my Adam's apple, now Anna would say it's covered by my double chin, but my Adam's apple was like out to here. I mean, I was like so shrunken in. I had like four, I got down to 4% body fat. I mean, I bet I looked terrible. I really did. I had muscles, but I literally looked bad. But I was... It was a root of rejection in me that was trying to cover it by my appearance, low, you know, insecurity, inferiority, and it led to, you know, rebellion and anger and all kinds of things. And I had no idea that was even there. I had no idea that was there. And the Lord began to show me, um, you have a root of rejection. And I remember even in high school, I don't know if you remember Rocky III, this is a long time ago, but... Rocky III was fighting the Russian, Dolph Lundgren. I, I don't even know what his name was. That Russian dude with blonde hair. He was like so ripped and buff. And that's the way I wanted to be in high school. I was like, that's who I want to be. And I was like far, far from being that guy. And I remember somebody in, as a sophomore in high school said, called me Opie, you know, from the Andy Griffith show. <laughs> so I wanted to be like Dolph Lundgren, you know, ripped, cut, tan, blonde hair, spiked up. You know, you can look him up in Rocky III if you know what I'm talking about. But he called me Opie, and I'm like, I just remember that, like, wounded me so bad back then. I mean, it's funny now, but it wounded me back then so bad and, like, drove me to, like, bodybuilding and, you know, working out all the time in the tanning bed and getting my house so, like, worried about my hair. And then the thing is, everyone, based on your personality, responds differently to the root of rejection. But the point is... There are, there's fruit that comes from rejection, and, and the sooner you realize, oh, the reason I'm doing this is because of rejection, the sooner you go free. Because I started realizing, oh, my goodness, I'm so critical of people. I'm so quickly to judge people and to criticize people because I have this root of rejection in my life. I'm so quickly to be angry or inferior or get depressed 
because I had this root of rejection. When I started realizing that, my eyes were opened and I, was, I could actually go free. You know, Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. And it's when we see the truth and we confront the truth by the scriptures and we get rooted and planted in God's love, then we can go free. We can then have the victory over rejection. Okay, so... So what I'm going to do, just I'm going to talk about some of the causes of rejection, and then we're going to end with a confession that you can have uh, over your life. Okay, so some of the things that can cause rejection, I got these in the notes, so you can read these more. I'm just going to read through these just pretty quick. Is, is if you were raised by one or more parents who had a deep root of rejection, then you also can experience a root of rejection because if they're parenting you and they have a root of rejection, they're going to they're gonna parent you from the root of rejection. Does that make sense? And, and it's important that even as parents, that we, to, to be good parents, that we get set free from rejection, else we're going to parent or grandparent from a root of rejection. And so if you've been raised by parents with a deep root of rejection, that likely could be a cause of rejection for you. Okay, when one or more parents favored another sibling above you. I'm just going to read through these pretty fast. Abuse, whether physical, verbal, sexual, or emotional abuse. Withheld and unexpressed love. Unwanted pregnancy. Contemplated or attempted abortion. Parents wanting a different gender. Parents wanting a boy but having a girl. Born with some type of defect, such as a learning disability or physical impairment. Traits. Like Opie, I'm just kidding. Traits that others make fun of, such as height, weight, some other unique feature. Abandonment, whether by parents, a spouse, or a child. Death of one or more, death of one or both parents, especially at a young age. A parent with mental illness. Rejection by friends, a lover, a spouse. Divorce, whether you divorced your spouse, they divorced you or you were a child affected by divorce. Strife and contention between parents while you were growing up. A spouse having an affair or addicted to pornography. See, I mean, I, there, I could probably list a lot more, but, I, but you get the idea. Yeah, I mean, the, the likelihood that no one, that, that not every, almost every single person listening to this, whether in person or online, have not experienced one of those things is very low. I mean, probably all of us have experienced some of that stuff. And so what I'm going to do here, again, we're going, to unco- we're going to unpack this. We're going to go deep in this over the next few weeks because it's so deep and so important that we, we uncover it and get healing from it that, that uh, you know, we won't go through everything today. But I just want to end with this confession. Um, and I've got it in the notes. I would encourage you to pray this and to confess this about you about confess this over your life until you believe it. And, and then even when you believe it, just keep confessing it. Um, that I am who God says I am. Before I was born, you knew me. That's scripture. Before I was born, you knew me. Do you realize that? God knew you before you were born. And he chose you. And he created your destiny. That's what it talks about in Ephesians chapter 2. Before the world. And you chose me before the foundation of the world. If you're born and you're here, it's because God knew you and God chose you. You called me to yourself. See, if you're a Christian, you didn't, if you're truly born of the Spirit, you didn't just wake up one day and realize. I think I might want to just follow Jesus. No, there was a the Lord who loves you and chose you before the foundation of the world. The Lord who knew you before you were born drew you to himself. And he formed you. You can read Psalm. I highly recommend if you struggle with the root of rejection, read Psalm 139. It's so incredible of God's, God's intimate thoughts about you. You created me for yourself. You formed me the way you desired. The way you are is because God formed you the way he desired. Because your hand is upon me, I am fearfully and I am wonderfully made. 
Your eyes, I'm just basically quoting Psalms 139. Your eyes saw me before I was born. And in your book, you wrote down all the days that were ordained for me, even before a single day had passed. That's scripture. You're here because God chose you. You were born because God chose you. Think about this. You think about me all the time, and every thought you have about me is precious. Now, if you're living in sin, not probably every thought is precious, but God's thoughts towards you are precious. In fact, he says in Psalms 139, you're, I'm just paraphrasing, your thoughts can't be numbered. Your thoughts about me, God, your thoughts about me can't be numbered. For your loving, kind, and caring thoughts about me outnumber all the grains of sand on the earth. I asked chat GPT, I said, how many grains of sand on the earth? And they were like, well, you asked a difficult question. That's really hard to understand by, uh, but some scientists have estimated it that there's seven and a half quintillion grains of sand in the earth. That's 10 times, or that's one times 10 to the 18th power. So that's, how God has more than that, more, he thinks about you more than that. So let's just say he, he thinks he has Eight quintillion, eight quintillion thoughts about you. And they're precious. Now, some of those would be like, what are you doing? You know, why are you doing this stupid thing? You know, repent. But God's thoughts towards you are precious. God thinks about you. He loves you. He's, he is thinking about you all the time. Eight quintillion, I mean, is that the way I'm saying? Eight quintillion thoughts about you. More than the sands that are cover the earth. Eight quintillion thoughts. Okay, so when you are having a bad day, just say eight, tw eight I can't even hardly say it, speaking in tongues. Eight quintillion thoughts about me. Your thoughts are precious towards me. <laughs> Seriously, I'm serious. Take this confession in the notes and just pray it over and over and over and over. Put it in your bathroom mirror whatever as you're getting ready, and just, just think about this. Meditate upon this. Think about how God views you. I am my beloved's, and he is mine. You are God's beloved. You are God's beloved, and he desires you, and he is yours. I am deeply loved and cherished. The bridegroom God deeply loves you and cherishes you. You may not feel it all the time, but he absolutely deeply loves you and cherishes you. You are forgiven and declared righteous in Christ. You are beloved and chosen, 1 Thessalonians 1.4. You are beloved by God and he has chosen you. He's chosen you. You are chosen. You are beloved by God and chosen. Even if you don't believe it, it doesn't change it. God has, God has chosen you. You are beloved to him. God is your father, and you are his chosen and precious child. He's inscribed your, he's inscribed your name on the palm of his hands, and he has called you by name. He's called you by name. Now, to quote Misty Edwards, I'm in love with God, and God's in love with me. This is who I am. I'm not going to try to sing it, thankfully. This is who I am, and this is who I'll be. And that settles it completely. Nothing, if you could get this one thing right in your life, nothing else will matter about your life. I am in love with God. God's in love with me. This is who I am, and this is who I be, and that settles it completely. It does not matter what this person or that person or this person this organization or that organization or this person, that family member says, God's in love with you, you're in love with God, that settles it completely. To be rooted and grounded in the love of God, that's the only thing that matters in this life at the end of the day, is that you know God's love, you're planted in God's love, you experience God's love that surpasses knowledge, and then you begin to live out of your, the rest of your days from the soil of God's love for you that flows out into the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The creator of the universe 
knew you before you were born. That's scripture. He told Jeremiah, I knew you before you were born. God knew you before you were born. And God saw to it that you were born. God saw to it that you were born. He knew you before you were born. He formed you in the womb exactly the way he wanted you to be. For him, you have been created by God for him. Exactly the way God wanted you to be. The creator, the, the creator of the universe knew you before you were born. He chose you before the world was created. He set his affections upon you before you existed. He called you to be alive at this very time. You're chosen by him for this time. You've been chosen for such a time as this. You are special and precious and beloved to him. Because I am precious and chosen by you, you have called me by name. I am yours. I have been chosen by you to speak your word. You have been chosen by God to minister to him. You've been chosen by God to pray for his purposes. God loves you. You love God. This is your identity, and this is what gives you value and worth. Not by what, how you look. Not by what you do, not by how smart you are, not by how much influence you have, not by how much money you have, not by how successful you are, not by your accomplishments. What gives you value and worth and the only thing that matters is God loves you, God set his affection on you, God chose you, God says you're my beloved, you are mine. He writes you on the palm of his hand. He says you are mine, I have chosen you. I think about you eight quintillion times I, I, you, just my thoughts about you are precious. That is the only thing that matters. That's what gives you value and worth. I'm in love with God. God's in love with me. That settles it completely. Rooted and grounded in the love of God. That we would live the rest of our days from that place of the soil of God's love. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Lord, I just want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for this. Lord, I pray there would be a revelation of how much we have been shaped and formed by rejection and that we would be transplanted, Lord, from the root of rejection, from the soil of rejection, into the soil of God's affection, from rejection to affection. Lord, from the rejection of people to the affection of God himself. Lord, may we be rooted and grounded in your love. May we, may we experience a transplant, Father, that, that shifts us from the soil of rejection to the soil of God's affection. Lord, that we would be rooted and grounded in the experiential love of God that surpasses knowledge, I pray. Lord, I pray there would be a revelation to all of us that we would see so much of the way I am, so much of what I do, so much of the fruit that's produced in my life is because of rejection that we might be a transformed people that are healed and delivered by the truth and the power of God so that we might be transplanted into the love of God to produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we pray that in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Amen.